we are looking at Peter Van Inwagen's metaphysics and as a resource for this primary material, we're using his book appropriately called Metaphysics. And the first video here at part one is we're exploring individuality. And in order to do that, we're also doing a broad introduction to metaphysics and how Van Inwagen approaches metaphysics. And then we're going to go on to look at a, a particular view of individuality that is how many things exist by considering nihilism, as we say in the Midwest. And so uh, the question explored is how many things exist? And there are a few different answers. Uh, the most common responses of philosophers are zero, so that would be nihilism. Uh, one, that would be monism, or many. Uh, it's odd says Van Inwagen, that we don't have a common defense of the answer being two, uh, of some form of dualism in metaphysics, but that's not really the kind of position that uh, very many people have taken. The response of many can also vary in two ways. Uh, one response could be many, but not that many, and another response could be many as in very, very, very many. And so before we get in on, on to the question of how many things exist, the topic of individuality, let's consider the common Western metaphysic. And Van Inwagen says there are certain characteristics that are held by people in the West and that are intuitively true. And he's following the process and methodology of Aristotle here, where he says, let's start by thinking about how normal people might consider these questions. And so one statement or, of the common Western metaphysic, one affirmation is that the objects of the world, things like trees or cats, buildings and chairs are real. Now I include Chairs is a form of irony for those who are familiar with Van Inwagen's metaphysics. There is a little inside joke there, but we need not tarry trying to explain that here. So we have real objects, and those real objects exist independently of what people believe. So they exist independently of what I believe, what anyone else thinks of them. They exist. They also have the characteristics they have, broadly speaking, independently of what we believe of them. So those, uh, what we'll later call intrinsic or internal characteristics, those exist independently of what anyone thinks about them. So uh, if all minds, uh, human minds disappeared, most of these things would continue to exist. Now, uh, the cat, or of course, any other object you might want to use as an example, has properties. Properties include things like being a certain height, having a certain mass, having a certain age. For a cat, maybe being soft, purring, uh, those kinds of things. And of course, all the other things that exist, individual things, have properties as well. Properties are things that could be shared. In other words, other things would have that same height, that same mass, the same age, the same degree of softness, uh, and other things would purr as well, of course, other cats. So uh, we have objects that exist. They exist independently of what we think about them. They have properties, and the cat can cause things to happen. So there are causal interactions among these individual things. Various other things, of course, can have causal influence on the cat. So causation is a topic in metaphysics that is an interesting idea to pursue and to think about. Finally, uh, the perceptions that I have of the cat are due to the influences that pass through space and they cause changes in my sense organs and my brain. So when I perceive the cat to be soft, going through the sense of touch, of course, when I perceive the color through vision, when I uh, hear the cat purr through auditory sensations, 
And those things are actually occurring in the cat. They are passed through, you might say, space. Uh, if you're touching the cat, there's not a lot of space. But in any case, they, they are there in the cat and they cause things to happen in my sense organs. And that causes things to happen in my brain. So causations are related to perceptions. And we could uh, also, in the realm of metaphysics, talk about uh, what's going on in the mind. But philosophers have broken that off into a different uh, field of study, philosophy of mind. OK, so that's the common Western metaphysics. So how have philosophers differed on various topics that we've just introduced? One thing is that they deny that the various things mentioned are actually individual objects. And so we'll see in this part and in part two uh, how that might occur. Uh, that is, say that actually no things exist or say that in reality only one things exist. So that's the topic of individuality that we are exploring soon. Another way that philosophers have differed from the common Western metaphysic is to deny that the various things that we just mentioned exist in space and time external to our minds. So uh, deny that there really are buildings, chairs, trees, cats that exist apart from what we think apart from what anyone believes about them. And that's the topic of externality. Are there things external to our minds? And then a third way that philosophers have differed with the common Western metaphysic is to deny that there is a person independent reality. That's the way it is, regardless of what we say about it, that there is an objective reality. So that's the topic of objectivity or relativism, again, uh, not in the realm of morality, but in the realm of metaphysics. So let's go on to address this question of individuality by asking this question, what's an individual thing? Now, the common Western metaphysics has given us examples. So we've mentioned uh, a few things. Here's another list, trees, rocks, the sun, birds, the Washington Monument, these seem to be individual things, but the common Western metaphysics doesn't really provide you with a definition of what it is to be an individual thing. So in order to get a grip on what an individual thing is, we might start with negatives. And so the common Western metaphysic uh, is, says that an individual thing is not a mere modification of something else, like a wrinkle in a carpet or a wave in the ocean. In part two, we'll explore the idea that that's what uh, these things are, but the common Western metaphysic denies that. It also says an individual thing is not a mere collection of things, like a, a collection of action figures or a basketball team, right? A collection of atoms, maybe, or molecules. Right. So the common Western metaphysics says, no, there's there's something that the collection actually makes that exists, that is something that's real, a tree or a cat or something else. And the common Western metaphysics says an individual thing is not a stuff, a very technical philosophical term. What do we mean by stuff? Well, think of things like water uh, or lead or butter, you know, uh, one being an element, one being uh, molecules, and the other one being much more complex. The common Western metaphysics said, no, it's not just a matter of stuff. There actually are individual things, and those aren't stuffs. And then a, another thing that an individual thing is not is a universal. Now, universal, as we've already mentioned, have several instances. These are properties like we described the cat having uh, properties or relations. Uh, universals could be include numbers. Uh, universal could be a book in, in a certain way. So like Van and Wagen's book, Metaphysics is uh, instantiated 
in numerous, numerous ways. It's also not an event or a process like a football game or an economic recession. These, these things are processes that occur over time and are not ever completely there at any given point in time. And so individual things are not like that, although uh, we will see uh, there is a view in metaphysics that kind of turns individual things into that, but the common Western metaphysic denies that. So what's the methodology going forward? I mentioned that the methodology is similar to Aristotle. We believe what is apparently the case is really the case. What we observe, what we find to be apparently true is really true, unless there's some known reason to think that what's apparently the case is not really the case after all. Now, I'm using page numbers from the fourth edition of his book. So there's a reference point for you for the methodology. So Van Inwagen defends this approach by saying, well, what other method could you use to start from? I mean, this is the only reasonable place to start from. You start from what's apparently the case and you, you believe that unless you already know there's a reason not to believe it. So he defends his methodology as something that seems to be obvious upon reflection. Okay. Now let's get into that particular topic of individuality. So we had our common Western metaphysic saying that individual things include things like trees or cats or the Washington Monument, right? Another alternative is to say, actually, there are no individual things, and that's nihilism, uh, or there is really just one individual thing. And we'll look at this idea of monism in part two. And finally, a nameless view that there are more than one, but not very many individual things. Uh, it's nameless because there's not, it's, it's hard to enumerate, right? More than one, not that many. Of course, the common Western metaphysics says that there are very, very many individual things. So let's consider the response that there actually are no individual things, and that's nihilism. Now, if the answer is zero, then you have to do some explanation of what are these things that we think are actually individual things. So we observe and apparently interact with computers and water bottles and cats and trees. So if those aren't individual things, what are they? If there are no individual things, what are the what what is it when we're talking about these are not individual oh, things, but rather Alexa is not very helpful right now. Alexa. Sorry about that. I'm not going to edit that out because I think that was kind of fun. Any case. Uh, individual things are not universals. If they were, they would have to be properties of something. Uh, but what would they be properties of? I mean, other universals, but that doesn't seem right. Uh, and then you would also have universals existing. So that doesn't seem like a good response. They don't seem to be modifications now, although, you know, we will explore that idea when we consider monism, uh, they're not modifications because then there would have to be something that exists that was modified, which is what the monist says. But the nihilism says there's nothing. Um, if there has to be something that's modified, that would lead to a circularity or an infinite regress, right? If A is a modification of B and B is a modification of C and C is a modification of D and so on and so on. Either you circle around back to A or it just goes on to infinity and it doesn't really make any sense, that approach. So nihilism, what other options can we consider? Well, the individual things would not be collections because then they'd have to be collections of something, right? And then those 
things their collections of would exist. And so the answer wouldn't be zero things exist. So that's not a good approach. And they're not going to be events because events by definition are changes in something or they're changes in relations among things. And so that would require something to exist that we could enumerate and the answer wouldn't be zero. So nihilism has a, a hard time here, according to Van Inwagen, making sense, right? Just, just what is the view? So the only option seems to be that the modifications or collections that we consider are stuffs. So what we think are individual things is actually a stuff like water. Uh, there really isn't anything made of water like copper, but there's actually nothing that exists that's made of copper. So water isn't an individual thing. Copper's not an individual thing. So that's how you get your answer zero. Then if you go with this approach though, you have to say that stuffs are homeomerous. That is, they are exactly the same through and through. So if we say water though, we're talking about H2O and we're talking about atoms and we're talking about atoms with a nucleus and protons, neutrons, and electrons, which of course could go on and on. So, but that's the only apparent way to go. There are no parts, right? It would have to be homeomerous, no atoms, no electrons, uh, because then there would be many things, in fact, many, many, many things, right? Uh, so that doesn't seem like a good response. So, Finally, though, also, we might say that the uh, response of nihilism, just since we've narrowed it down, right, we've gone through and eliminated the options, and we get to the only option being something that's homeomerous, but science simply doesn't support that there is something like that. Uh, we do think that atoms exist and electrons and so on. So Van Enwagen summarily dismisses nihilism as a reasonable option. In part two, we'll go on and consider monism.